922. So attendance was from 9 to 915. So those people who have showed up are going to pass the course. Well, as well as, as long as you do all the work that's required for the course, that is. But at least you're on the right step. Those people who are not here right now are going to fail today because attendance is mandatory, which means you need to show up to the class. So this is, I know, kind of rough and kind of, whoa, how am I going to fail? So don't worry about it. We're not going to run out of room because these guys all fit in the room, and these are the people who are going to take the class, which is great because CVIS requires mandatory attendance. The class only meets twice for the entire semester, two weekends. So that's why it's very important for you to show up. Otherwise, we can't have the class. We can't have a weekend class like this if we don't do it this way. Anyway, so <clears throat> enough lecture and let's get on with some fun stuff. So because you're going to be here for three days, I've sort of redesigned the class a lot to accommodate for making it interesting, making it interactive, um, allowing you, and I see most of you have your computers, which is fantastic. Um, if you don't have power, we're, we're bringing in power strips so we can, you know, let me know and uh, at, at, the at the first break I can accommodate you with some power. We're going to uh, get a lot of instruction. I'm not going to lecture to you for eight hours, however. Um, it's going to be about half the time of me talking. The other half is you guys get to do exercises and assignments and activities and stuff. So that's why you need to bring your computer, which means you get the work done in class, which is great. And then you'll be uploading it to the EMS. Um, and then at the lunch break, anyone who does not have an EMS account, um, come see me. Uh, because you'll need the access to the EMS. Actually, just to show of hands, does anyone in here not have an EMS account? Does no people know what the EMS is? <laughs> Are you all brand new to IT? Well, I have to go through the orientation right now anyway, so you'll find out in a few minutes what the EMS is <laughs> if you don't know. Uh, <clears throat> what you're looking at up here is uh, my website for brand new people. It is uh, bhecker at itu.edu. Oops, I was trying to focus in. Uh, let me put it up here again. And uh, my Zoom is no longer working. Huh, how oh, weird. I heard it. It does work. It's shift command. Okay. Uh, bhecker at itu.edu, uh, which is kind of interesting because this, in, this, this got smaller. Hold on one second. Let me close this window again. I just upgraded my operating system to uh, Mountain Lion, and the control keys aren't working the same. Oh, now how do I get it smaller again? <laughs> Zoom out. Uh, here we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. I see how that's working now. Uh, all right, so let me go back to my website. So if you go to this website, you'll find the materials for the course. You will not be able to submit anything in here. I've also populated out the LMS entry for the course, which I'll show you in a few minutes, which is where you're going to be submitting stuff to, and I'll show you how to do that. If you click on the uh, Oracle, okay, someone's talking in the back of the room. Okay, because of the, I'll just wait for him to stop talking. Are you done? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I can't talk over. If the people in the back are not going to be able to hear me if I have everybody in the room talking. Uh, so if you could just keep it down. Or the door is open. You can step outside and talk outside as long as you move a little bit away from the door so we don't get the echo and the hearing. So, Otherwise, I can't yell for three days straight either. So, <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> back to what I was trying to cover. We have... Uh, Fall 2012, if you click on that link and go into the one that says Oracle Database Management and Administration, you'll see the syllabus, which I'm going to go over in a few minutes, um, midterm exam, which I'll go over on Sunday, actually, uh, the CSLO essay I'll go over on Sunday, the regular old course materials here, uh, which is going to be a bunch of lectures here, and uh, then you'll see these in-class assignments for the first three days. So day one is today. Day two is tomorrow, day three is Sunday. And these are things that you cannot turn in after the weekend ends. The dates on the EMS are set for Tuesday, but they're going to be changed this evening, which means this is going to guarantee your attendance all day. So that's why it's important for me to know if you don't have EMS access, because you will not be able to submit it on time if you are here. So the way you qualify for attendance is to show up for class at 9 to 9.15, and then 
uh, submit these things when you're supposed to submit these things. Um, and then so everything is submitted by the end of the day. At the end of the day, the EMS entries for today get locked, so you can't do it after today, which means you have to show up after lunch. So <laughs> which means you don't need to be here, essentially. Uh, but I'm going to try and make it as interesting as possible. Um, so Because I know when I put this up here, I had some people going, oh, can we do them early? Can we do them later? No, <laughs> you're going to need to do them during the class, but I'll explain what you're doing when you're doing them, uh, which actually is, is not too bad. It's, it'll make the class a little bit more interesting as well. Um, and then, then we have some extra Oracle Essentials. These are going to work with a couple of the exercises that you're going to do. So, And uh, <coughs> if uh, you go into the LMS, so if you type in LMS.IT, it's too late to do attendance, by the way, if you just came in, .edu, uh, you'll end up going to see me at the lunch break, actually, and I'll talk to you about that. Um, you'll see this here. Um, well, you'll see something similar to this. You're not going to see this exactly like this. In fact, I don't have the, the student view, which is kind of a bummer. Um, if I go into my courses, you'll see for this particular course, your view is going to look different, but we have entries in the assignments for all of the assignments, and you'll see there's a lot of them in here because they're all broken out. And these are the dates that are going to be, I, I set them a little bit farther ahead so we wouldn't have any problems with the setup, but they'll be adjusted. They're, these first set of number six is going to be due today during the class, and then tomorrow we'll have another set, and then Sunday we'll have another set, which is basically, and that's, I'm just explaining it because it's kind of a new format in terms of what's going on. So if you click on the syllabus link, you'll be taken to this screen here, or this document here. It's a Microsoft Word document. I just want to talk about the class a little bit and uh, what we're going to be doing. So we know we only meet twice. I personally, I kind of like it, actually. It's only two times. So it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So you have to take a Friday off of work, but it's only twice. It's actually not bad, especially if you're going to pay to fly if you're like living somewhere else and you have to pay to fly to California. <coughs> maximize your stay and only fly twice. It's cheaper than buying three weekends. So it's actually a good deal. I, plus me, I don't have to like reserve every three weeks. I, I get an extra weekend in my schedule, you know, by just being here on an extra Friday. And really, it's just today. It's just extra Friday. So I, I kind of like it. This is the first time we're trying the schedule out, though. But it is kind of intense, three days straight. So I don't know. We'll see how it works. By the end of the by the end of this class, we'll go. I'll know whether or not I'm going to do this again. So, and I'm the only one doing it. And in order for them, in order for them to allow me to do it, I had they required mandatory attendance. Because what ends up happening, students won't show. They'll only go for one weekend or something. You know, if it's too relaxed, and then we can't. We'll totally get in trouble. So. We'll see what happens. Uh, so I'm Barbara Hecker. Uh, my email address is here, bhecker at itu.edu. Most of you know that already. Uh, the course description, we're talking about Oracle in this class, Oracle Database and Administration. And uh, we'll be looking at the architecture, issues of administration, advanced techniques for security, object management, performance analysis, SQL tuning. Uh, you can read the description. You can read the learning outcomes as well. I will tell you. Uh, you don't really need this book here, but it's a good book if you've never taken an undergraduate course in databases. So I usually get uh, people that have taken databases and actually work as an Oracle administrator. I've got people that are healthcare management majors or business administration majors who are switching over to software engineering who have never taken a database class before. Or I get people who are taking a computer science track, but they just started it. And so, anyway, long story short, various different skill levels. If you're brand new to computer science, brand new to databases, I highly recommend this book, actually. It's been out in print for a very long time. Um, it is um, pretty easy to understand. It goes through entity relationship diagramming. It goes through SQL. It goes through a lot of the basic concepts, which you're going to miss um, because this class is at a graduate level, so I'm not going to teach you. Well, we're going to go through SQL and we're going to go through entity relationship diagramming, but it's not an introduction to databases course, which is kind of interesting. Um, but don't worry about it. You'll still be able to pick up the pieces um, in terms of the background knowledge if you don't have that already. But uh, the book, eh, don't go out and buy it unless you want to spend money. Um, but uh, the ISBN is the newest edition. There's also older editions of the book, which are equally as good. So, grading. Well, this doesn't fit on one page. Well, it should. There we go. 
We have uh, take-home assignments that, okay, so for every hour you're in class, you have an hour of work outside of class by WASC accreditation. So you've met your CVIS requ requirements by showing up. <laughs> you have to meet your WASC requirements by doing assignments outside of class. So you'll be doing some assignments inside of class and then also some outside. So your outside is just five assignments. They're worth three points each. It's only 15% of your grade. Not significant, really. It's a small percentage, actually. Uh, but some of them are, will be duplicated with similar exercises in class, so you'll know how to do them, hopefully, uh, by the time you uh, are going to do that. You'll notice we have 36%. The highest percentage of your grade is for activities that are going to be performed in class. So you'll participate in 12 in-class assignments. The two assignments are conducted per day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So, and the exercises can only be counted in class during, can only be completed in class during the weekend class set meeting, and they'll be uploaded to the EMS. I'll be able to see the dates in which you have uploaded them into the EMS. So, time and date stamped. Midterm exam. It's a take-home midterm exam. One, one of them is going to be halfway through, and I'll explain that to you on Sunday. So, we come and we meet this weekend, and then I don't see you again until November, I think. Yeah, first weekend in November. So this is kind of like the first weekend in October, and then a month later, first week is weekend in November. And in between, you'll do the take-home midterm that will be due at the start of the next meeting. And then you'll have uh, the CSLO that will be due at the end of the course. I'll talk about that next time, because that's it. So you have a month in between, and then you have a month after the next meeting. Then you're done. So it's really a one, two, three-month course or so. So it's not too bad. Uh, so let's see, well, 3 times 4 is 12. Yeah, it's about 12 weeks or so, class time. Which is kind of shorter, actually. It's not too bad. Um, and you'll have a final exam. Final exam will be during the last weekend here in class. Midterms take home. So the only thing that's in class are the in-class exercises and then the final exam, which will be worth 20% of your grade. That will be taken uh, during the last meeting of the last day. So when you book your tickets for the next weekend, you cannot go home Saturday night because you'll miss the final exam on Sunday afternoon. So you're going to have to take a late night flight on Sunday <laughs> at 6 o'clock or 6.15. We're really close to the airport, however. <laughs> so you just drag your luggage here. You, you schedule a 6.30 flight and, or a you know, 7.30 flight or whatever, and you're back Sunday night. But just make sure you're here for the afternoon. Because uh, if not, you're going to miss the final. So. Uh, so let's see. You could have actually flown in this morning if you had an early morning flight and then attended today without having to spend and you know, but and you know you're all adults you can schedule your own time academic dishonesty you may have heard the rumors that we're actually enforcing it now so <laughs> we were enforcing it before but not everybody was enforcing it but now everybody's enforcing it actually the administration is enforcing it so we don't really have a say uh, the assignments will be actually run through a program called turn it in uh, automatically through the EMS so they don't have to do it manually anymore last term they did it manually they looked at assignments and they audited classes and they checked on everything. And those people who turned in duplicate work that matched other people's work got an F for it. Some people failed classes. It was kind of a big thing around the campus. People were talking about it. And it applies towards all classes, not just my classes, Minwoo's classes. Everybody's classes got audited. And uh, what ends up happening is if you don't do your own work, you're not going to get any credit for your own, for somebody else's work. You're going to have a problem. You're going to have to retake the class. So you don't really, seriously, you don't want to waste your time. So if, um, if you haven't found out already, uh, it's, not, it's not good to plagiarize. Um, they're going to make some signs, actually, and stick them around the campus. You know, I, I haven't seen the signs yet, but uh, we'll probably they'll be up before the WASC visit, perhaps. Who knows? Um, but uh, we have a huge WASC visit, actually, coming up in October, uh, a couple weeks from now, actually, where we'll get our final accreditation. You guys want accreditation. Yes, you want accreditation. I can tell you, you want it. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, you want it. Which is why we're doing all this stuff, because we, we want it as well. You want it, we want it, let's get it. So uh, we'll have automatic plagiarism checks on the EMS entries. So even if nobody, a human doesn't catch it, the machine will catch it. So don't risk it, is what I'm saying. Tennis requirements, we all know about that. I already harped on that. It's mandatory. And it's mandatory from 9 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock at night. We'll have, an, we'll have a lunch break. We'll have breaks. We'll have stuff. So it's not like kindergarten. Well, it's kind of like kindergarten, I guess. So grade school, high school. This is what I'm say, high school. So <laughs> but hopefully we'll get to the point where we won't have to do this anymore. <clears throat> people will just show up and people will just participate. So.
we'll see what happens. Hey, I take attendance at other schools too, so and I have mandatory attendance and stuff. And same same thing applies. I uh, grading formula is pretty good here. If you show up, you do the in class assignments. You're probably going to end up with an A in the course. So if you're worried about, you know, you took a class last term and you failed it because you plagiarized or something, this is your opportunity to make up your grade, actually. Because as long as you abide by the policies, that's all we're asking for. Um, you've turned in mediocre work, you know, not even good stuff. You abide by the policies, you show up, you turn in those six assignments that are in class, you'll end up with an A. You know, if you don't get an A, it's something wrong with you. <laughs> no, no, actually not. I mean, it, it, it's uh, we're trying to make it so if you just abide by the rules, you're going to get a good grade in the course, which will make up for anything that you did last term that perhaps got you in trouble or something like that. So hopefully that will improve your GPA by the end of the course. No guarantee, however. You do have to do the work correctly so and show it for all three days. And so we'll see what happens. Uh, so the class meeting format, which is the different parts of this, actually. So each day we're going to meet from 9 o'clock a.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. with an hour lunch break. Probably going to make that an hour and a half. We'll see what happens. See, because here's how it works. For each hour of in-class, we have 10 minutes. This is OSHA, actually. OSHA says for each hour in class, you can have a 10-minute break. If it's an eight-hour class, we have 80 minutes, right? That's like 60 minutes is an hour. We have an extra hour, but we have to be here from 9 to 6. So in the hour, we're actually here for nine hours because of that one-hour lunch. So we have another hour to play with. So I'm thinking about long lunch, actually, at least a half hour extra long lunch. And then maybe we'll get out at 5.30 instead of 6 or something, you know. So we'll play it by ear and we'll see what happens. But I know I have an extra hour to play with. But prepare to be here from 9 to 6 just in case is what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> definitely not before 5.30. 5.30 would be the earliest that we would get out of here. But uh, plan your day from 9 to 6. We'll see what happens. I'd rather take, uh, because I know there's going to be people around campus looking to see if this class is still going on at 6. Mm -hmm. Just the same way as there's people that are going to show up and go by the door in a few minutes to see if they're actually running right now at 9-something, 9 9.39. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to be audited, so I want to make sure at least today we stay till 6 so we know that uh, so we don't get in trouble. You, you get in trouble. I get in trouble, too. So <laughs> I have to make sure I don't get in trouble. So. Uh, classes will be conducted, all students must attend, yada yada. And I bring a computer, you brought a computer, which is great. And if you haven't discovered it, we have a, you, a code up there, 355IT11, the internet code, where you can get connected. If you don't have a computer, how many people don't have a computer with them today? I mean, you're not going to raise your hand, probably, because you're going to look lame. I don't have a computer. Computers are cheap. So we have library computers that we might be able to loan to anyone who's shy, who doesn't have a computer with them today. They're not the best computers, but they'll get you through the day. Everybody has a computer, though, which is great. Nice. Plus, now, you know, if you get bored of me, you can surf the Internet. <laughs> check up on your Facebook, check your email. You know. I do the same thing. <laughs> when I get bored of you, I'm going to turn this off and check my email and stuff, too. <laughs> so. All right, so Friday morning is what we're looking at. So and momentarily, I'm going to start with Chapter 1, Overview of Databases. Then we're going to look at uh, Introduction to Database Design. So the course is about Oracle Administration Database Architecture. However, it's a graduate level course, and it makes no sense to teach you an application. So believe it or not, you can probably get through the course without installing Oracle. And I'm not going to bother with the install of Oracle, actually. I'm going to show you where you can install it. However, the Oracle version 11G does not work on XP. Well, it doesn't work nicely on XP. And I have XP on my partition here. And it doesn't work on a MacBook. However, Oracle is Oracle is kind of simple. What you're looking at and what I'm going to teach you is the command line interface. If you're looking for a how to use Oracle as an application, the wrong class. If you're looking at studying the Oracle features, the design, the capabilities, how to work with the database, right class. How to design databases. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you is going to be applying towards Oracle, but also MySQL and other databases in general. So it's database concepts that are associated with client-server databases. Oracle is a version of a client-server database. So it's designing the tables, designing the, 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 the privileges, the structure, the administration of it. And that how to click here, click here, and run a database. That's kind of stupid, actually. 
In fact, every time an Oracle puts out a new release, the interface is a little bit different. And you can learn that probably in about an hour, hour and a half. It's kind of like if you take a writing course, it's not about learning Microsoft Word. It's about learning how to write. So this class is about learning how to write databases and design databases, more fundamentals and concepts in, ter in terms of the theory of database design. So what you'll be doing and why you need your computers is because we're going to be creating entity relationship diagrams and we'll be uh, running SQL queries and things where you can install Oracle and you'll have a query engine to work with or you could possibly do it without, that's what I'm saying. Or you could use Microsoft Access actually for testing out query statements. We're not going to get into queries, however, until <clears throat> Saturday, Sunday-ish. So I'll save the Oracle install till Saturday, till tomorrow. So we're not going to install Oracle today. Um, I'll kind of wait on that. I'm looking to see if I could pick up a Microsoft uh, 7 or something. Um, I, have a, I have a Parallels partition on this MacBook uh, virtual machine, which I'm loading XP on. Um, and uh, up until 10G... It's either that or I have to get myself a copy of 10G. Uh, I can't run it on XP, so which is kind of senseless, senseless actually. But uh, at the break, I'm actually or during the lunch, I'm probably going to look for it to see if I can get an old copy of 10G. Unless someone's got a copy of 10G out there, so yeah. I probably could go to a library, find it in a book, or uh, at the, an old bookstore. Probably could find. You know how they used to burn the discs and put them in the back of the books? Yeah, I need an old copy because nothing works with XP anymore. So. So you're going to run into the same problem if you're still using XP, but most people switch to Windows 7, so Windows people. So I'm just not that dedicated to Windows. All right, so uh, first thing we're going to look at is the entity relationship diagramming concept and designing databases in terms of that concept. And then uh, we'll have a lunch break here uh, about 12 to 1. Possibly I'll let you know exactly what time we'll be coming back. I'm probably going to go an hour and a half, go to 12 to 1.30. So I'm going to go with that so we, can, so we have that extra half hour in there. Plus it gives you longer to go out and get food and stuff. There's the subways right down the street. There's plenty of places to walk to. It's probably not a bad idea to get stretch your feet anyway. So, um, And then uh, after lunch, well, we'll have an exercise. We'll have one of our lab assignments that's going to be submitted before lunch, uh, which it won't be too bad. I'll start around 11, probably maybe more like 10, 30, 11. So we'll kind of go easy this first day, kind of get into the habit of doing stuff. And then um, after lunch, we will have entity relationship modeling. And then this exercise is going to be an entity relationship modeling exercise. Uh, I'm going to try and get some paper, but uh, we also are going to need to sort of uh, figure out how we're going to get, because some of this stuff is much better done by hand than it is. Uh, but if you do it by hand, then you have to scan it into a computer. <laughs> so, and how are you going to scan it into a computer in a class, which is kind of interesting. So uh, during uh, this time period, we'll, I'm going to solve the problem and either get you with a smart draw or a diagramming tool of some sort. Smart draw is not a bad one, actually. There's tons of tools out there. So we'll, after lunch, we'll be downloading some tools, taking a look at what, what we can use. Um, and then you'll be uploading those files from whatever tool we select. So, um, but we'll have to work on everything. So, and I see we have mostly... Windows people in here. I do see some MacBooks. So OmniGraphy is actually a really good one for Mac people. Um, so I'll go through that though. It'll be more interesting um, after lunch today. And then we'll do a dependency diagram exercise. And then uh, we'll probably, uh, that'll take us through the end of the day going over the first and the second exercise. So that's the game plan for today. For tomorrow, we're going to look at the same kind of schedule, but we'll be looking at turning those entity relationship diagrams into table structures, building the tables in the database concepts, a little bit more on the relational model. So this weekend uh, is highly focused on entity relationship modeling, database modeling, and design. On Sunday, uh, we're looking at introduction to SQL. Uh, so Sunday is going to be, Friday and Saturday is going to be on entity relationship diagramming modeling. Sunday is going to be like the start of the following. So it's going to be SQL, advanced SQL queries and stuff like that. So after we get through the design. And then the following weekend, on a, the weekend number two, which is going to be in about a month from now, we'll have the uh, more SQL stuff. And then we'll be putting the pieces together, looking at internet databases, looking at Oracle features, um, and some of the Oracle essentials. And then uh, database storage, indexing, and then we'll have our final exam, and then we'll be done with the course. So it will actually move kind of quickly. 
um, as we go through it. And then on Sunday, I'll tell you what's due before my, November 1st. So you'll have a clear plan. Clear plan for ex, for completing everything. So, Questions, comments, or concerns before we start? Nope. And I'm going to try to take breaks like five or ten minutes after every hour and a half or so. So if you do have to go to the restroom or something like that, it's not rude. Just go out and go to the bathroom. Cause don't wait for my breaks because it may never happen. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Although I'm drinking coffee, so <laughs> we'll see. I might have to go to the bathroom soon. So. <laughs> All right. So I had to do the obligatory introduction or overview. So, because it wouldn't be a start of a class without an introduction or overview. <coughs> so, this lecture is pretty small. I'm going to kind of thumb through it. This is one of the ones that's called 1A. Uh, it's on the website. It's actually in the LMS as well. Um, so, a lot of people that don't want to stare up here, you can put it on your computer and you can watch it on your computer if you want as well. Um, if you don't want to watch the screen up here. But, uh, what we're going to look at is uh, just a brief overview of databases just to orient you to the concept, just in case you are from healthcare management or something else, and this is your first database course. Um, so those people who have experience with databases are probably going to be bored right now. So tune me out and check your email or something at this, at this time. Um, so we're going over the history, entity relationship modeling as a concept, which might make the picture a little bit clearer, especially when we start the next lecture. So originally we had file-based approaches and file-based systems, which was a hierarchical database. And one of the assignments is actually going to have you compare hierarchical with object-oriented with relational database models. 95% of the market is still relational. Relational models, well, the relation is another word for table, actually. This is where that word comes from. And uh, it's a table-based. So the relation has uh, the connotation of a relationship associated with it as well. So we put things in tables and we create relationships between the tables and then we have a relational database <laughs> essentially in concept by definition. Object-oriented databases are a lot different. They don't work with tables. They work with object components and methods and data that's held in the object. So the object might be an HR object and it might have instances of data for each instance of the object that's created. I think that's a little bit more confusing actually, uh, than one table that holds many different instances of the same kind of object or entity. And I'm going to use the word entity all day today. An entity is an object. It's the pre-object terminology. So entities and objects are sort of the same thing, um, but they're used differently in database design, which is kind of interesting. Um, so when I say entity, if you don't know what an entity, think of an object. And then we have instances of objects, if you're familiar with object orientation. If you're not familiar with object orientation, don't worry about it. You don't have to be. But know that uh, instances or entity occurrences, uh, which is the equivalent entity relationship terminology, so it's an occurrence, it's a person, uh, and then we have many different people, which are occurrences of people. So if you take an example of a student object or a student entity, we have instances of student entities sitting now next to you. Each one of you is a separate instance or separate occurrence of the type entity of the student, which is where the terminology is coming into. So we take data, we give it a name, and we put it in a table. We call it a student table. And in the student table, we identify first name, last name, all the data that we want to carry or store about the particular student entity. And we put many different occurrences of the students inside of the table. And that gives us the... Um, gives us the database table that we're using. And then we take that table, that, that entity, and we relate it to other entities. So there's a way of creating it so that we have things logically organized, and we have only student data in the student table, and only class data in the class table. And then we can perform uh, queries on the data using the relationships between the data. So the data relationship of a student, will students take classes? And if I had a classes table, I might have a registration table. So there's uh, information that's stored with which students are taking which classes. There's probably a classes table as well in the system, if we're talking about a university database, which stores all the classes, what time they meet, who's teaching them, all that stuff that's associated with a class. And so the concept of a relational database is, is nothing more than that in a nutshell. 
separating the data out, creating the relationships, and making it so it can be queried. We have good database design, and then we have really bad database design. And those are categorized by what's called normal forms. And I'm going to get into normal forms probably not until the second class meeting. Um, I mean, second weekend, I should say. Uh, but normal forms are giving us our quality. Because anyone, it's kind of like writing a paper. If you, anyone can write a research paper. So some research papers are better than others. <laughs> so some of them have more accurate information in them. They're formatted better. They're more readable. They're more interesting. Some of them actually, believe it or not, that are written, poorly written are actually interesting. Uh, so there's different ways of judging the quality of a paper. Well, there's different ways of judging the quality of a database as well. If you follow standard practices when you're writing a paper, you might have an introduction, you might have some body paragraphs and a conclusion. And someone taught you how to do that, you're usually in high school or something when they teach you how to write papers or maybe undergraduate. You say, this is how you write a research paper, right? Well, what I'm going to show you today is how to write a database. <laughs> so databases don't have introductions, body paragraphs, and conclusions, but there's other components that databases have. And the databases have the proper identification of the entities, which separates them out into the proper table structures. And then we have the proper key organization. And then we have the proper queries that are performed on the keys to make it work correctly. So it's the difference between looking at a table base, a table, a database design that was written by someone who's taken a database class versus a table database design by someone who just, you know, put up a dartboard and started throwing darts at it. You know, to see, or flip a coin. I think I need this table. I think I need that table. So hopefully by the end of the course, you can actually probably identify a good design from a bad design because you'll know what the components are. And the components are associated with the normal forms. So usually what ends up happening is you get into a company and you look at the database and you go, whoa. First thing I would do is like, what normal form is this in? And I go, oh, first or second. I hardly ever find a third. And if you get it into a third normal form, and I'll go through that later, You've got a good, decent design. And then sometimes you might run into a fourth normal form. The normal forms go up higher than third. But then the higher the normal form, the more efficient you make the paper or the database design, the harder it is to use it. So some of you, uh, during your academic research, you know, you know, there's a level of writing a paper, actually, that's readable. And if you've ever read some of these technical articles, it's like every little line is a quotation, is a cite, a reference citation. You get to the point where the paper is so well written, it's hard to read it. <laughs> and it's boring. I hate reading technical documents like journal articles and stuff because it's just like, you know, just leave out all the quotes. I don't want to hear about who said what and where this information came from. I just want to read the paper. So you have different levels of writing, and the higher you get, the unreadable, the more, more unreadable, the more technically correct it is. Well, the same thing happens with databases. So we'll see how we can take from a fourth and bring it back down to a third to normal to, to, to lower the normalization to make it more usable, which is some of the things we'll be talking about as well in the course. Um, and the overall structure. So some databases can be queried easily, some can't. So the ones that can't have issues with them. So. All right, so uh, those are concepts that are associated with the database approach. And the database approach is just a shared collection of logically related data, yada, yada. The file-based approach puts them in files. So we started out with a file-based approach. problem with it is everything's separated out. So companies put in databases. Every company's got a database. Every application is running with a database these days because then we are allowed to share information throughout the entire organization. And the data is not just local to one group. So sharing of the data is kind of important. Um, also, the, another concept is the lack of duplication of the data. If we take and we write, in fact, Google Docs was great because Google, do, do Google Docs eliminates the duplication of data from a file-based approach, file-based system. In the old days before Google Docs, we used to take and email files to each other, and people would change it. And like two people would change the, the, the report simultaneously and we have multiple versions of it going around and you know which is the last version of this and why did you change that and then your change overrode my change and blah 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 blah. So Google Docs came around and said well share it. It's sort of working like a database and it's shared access to the same file so everybody's updating the same thing. Well that's what a database does for the data in the organization. If a new customer comes in and buys something Marketing knows about it, sales knows about it, customer service, technical support, everybody knows about the sale, which is great. 
because it's shared. So databases provide this shared data component. And uh, we have data dependencies. So we have a you know customer table, for example, that stores the customer information. And then uh, we don't have like multiple customer information stored everywhere. That's common, actually. In fact, that's not a third normal form database. That's a, that's a second. Well, it's one and a half to a two normal form database. When you walk in, in fact, most people, most companies are doing this, which is kind of odd. Well, because they're not hiring professionals or hiring IT people to write the databases. And some of the people have never taken a database design course before. They have no idea what they're doing. But sales has customer information and marketing has customer information and technical support. Oh, yeah, let me add you into the technical support database. And when I hear that, I'm like, why? I'm already in your database. I bought your product. How come you don't have my information? Oh, that's a separate database table. We don't have access to that. That's a bad database design. You know, it's like, uh, why do you have all that duplicate information? Because what if I move? And sometimes people move. And then, or I change my telephone number. And I guess it has to be changed in 10 different areas in the database? Not only that, but it's a waste of storage space. But uh, anyway, so grouping the data logically, organizing it, getting rid of the duplications and the inconsistencies, raises it to normal, to a third normal form kind of uh, approach. May also have incomplete files, incomplete records. So we have these things called constraints that we can put, and part of the design is identifying the database constraints so that you can't put a customer into the customer information table who doesn't have a first name <laughs> or who doesn't have, and you'll see that, you guys see this as no first name or first name unknown or FNU or whatever. Well, that comes out of, it's a requirement, it's a constraint on the database, it's not going to come in you can't not have a first name um, in terms of the design of the database. So. Uh, so we have this concept of the database management system. It's the software that's being used. So this is not a database management system course where you're learning how to use software because that you can learn on your own. In fact, it's going to change. Whatever it is I showed you in this class is going to change probably. I mean, we're only up to 11G. I remember 7. 7G was pretty good. Uh, we're getting more complicated. Well, I should say the interface is actually getting a little bit easier. because Some of the options are going away. But uh, the software itself, you're going to learn whatever software you're going to be using for this to implement it on your own, most likely. So. so in terms of the database management system, we have categories of things to look at in terms of its configuration. The data definition language, data manipulation language, and then the control. So these are the areas, and I've divided out the lectures actually to kind of focus on these three different areas. So data definition language is defining the tables, defining the key constraints, the triggers, the, all of the information that we're going to need to actually build the structure, the underlying structure. The data manipulation language is the protocols or procedures and rules and things that are going to be used to access the data, the queries that are going to be run on that. And for manipulation is to update something, to add a new entry, insert stuff. And then the control, security, privileges, access control, recovery. So we'll spend a little bit of time in all three of these areas. And the components of the database management system itself. It's hardware, software, data, procedures, and people. It's you who's actually designing the database, which is kind of interesting. Because you know a lot of companies do, and this is kind of interesting. They do this with a lot of other applications as well, not just databases. You go out and you buy PeopleSoft, or you go out and you buy an accounting system, and the company installs it and the IT people, here he is, there's the accounting system. But nobody knows how to use it. Actually, PeopleSoft is a great example. And this is hard. You have to actually go to PeopleSoft school. Uh, nobody knows how to use it. So great, you bought the application. It's kind of like saying, hey, I'm going to be a college student. I'm going to go buy a computer. What do you do with it? You know? So. Oh, I'm going to go build a house. Here, here's a toolbox. <laughs> so anyway, a lot of people do this with databases, which is kind of interesting. So advantages of the database management system, control, redundancy, data. You can, you can read through this on your own, actually, so I'm not going to read it to you. But uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to using it. One of the disadvantages that I think are a little bit more interesting to look at, uh, additional hardware costs. Yeah. Actually, the school database is kind of an interesting example of that. As we grow, we have more simultaneous users. And we've gone to, for those people who have been at ITU for a while, we know we've gone through some growing pains with that EMS or the LMS, whatever it's called now. It's changed names over the years. 
but it's also gotten bigger and with new requirements and new structure and new redesign and then lo and behold it always goes down each term so it, it went down last term as well so. but it was after you guys turned your stuff in I think so and amazing uh, and now they're actually switching it over to a different server site so it'll go down for you towards the end of the term actually it's going to be unavailable for like a week or so, so. And then we switch it over. Maybe it might even happen before the WASP visit. Who knows? But we'll see what happens. Uh, yeah, hardware, maintaining expenses. And then you have to plan for growth and stuff. Um, also cost. It's expensive. you got to hire people to work with it. Complex. It might be complex. Cost of conversion performance and a higher impact of failure. <laughs> yeah, when the database goes down, everybody goes down. <laughs> it's kind of like when the Internet access goes down. Everybody goes down. So. And you have one database that's been controlled. The entire company is using it, and the database is gone. You might as well just shut the doors and go home, because you can't do anything, seriously. So that's one of the problems. All right, so uh, we have different conceptual views of the database. External view, conceptual level, internal view, which is going to get... There's plenty of room. There's actually a couple seats up here, guys. Uh... There's a couple seats. You don't have to use the chairs in the back. There's two over here, two over there. Um, good. If we start looking at the, the different levels of the views, usually it's the different uh, people that are using the system that are going to be determining which level or which view they're going to be associated with. Um, so the internal level is the physical representation, conceptual level is what we're going to be working with in terms of the entity relationship diagrams. The external level is the users of the system. So it's the people who are actually using it or getting the external view. The reason why we compose it out into three different levels in terms of the architecture is because they have different designs and different interfaces to them. As an example, Oracle is broken out into these three different conceptual views. We have a MySQL, excuse me, MySQL, we have an SQL plus window where we're looking at the internal level the actual writing, the query. The conceptual level is in terms of the designs. So there's GUI tools actually that work on a web based interface where you can drag and drop and you can conceptually create the design. And then the user sees something totally different. In fact, the user never really sees your database. The user is going to see your application that's going to be accessing the database. Um, so there really isn't very much to the external view for the most part. So. There's some chairs up here if you want to fill in. There's two of them in the corner. So. so functions of a database system. Obviously, it's storage. It's retrieval as well. So you're storing data, you're retrieving it, you're updating it. You have user accessibility catalog. In fact, the system account for Oracle stores all of the user data. So everything in Oracle is stored in the form of a table. User table configuration table, properties table, rights tables, even the data types that are available are in a table, which is kind of interesting because you link the table information up and then it creates the ability for you to easily conceptualize where to find something. So the user that logs in as a system or an admin into that account is able to manipulate those tables, usually through a GUI interface of some sort. So. Uh, transaction support, I'll talk about transaction management and concurrency support as well. The transaction concept is sort of key when it comes to the uh, database design. Uh, if you're looking for the attendance, it's not going to be available. You'll have to see me at the lunch break. So, um, let's see. So recovery services, support for data communications, integrity services, utility services, are some of the things that are being offered. So here's the picture that I like because it kind of makes it look better in terms of a picture of what we're looking at the components. So in this class, we're not really looking at the tool, the database, you know, how to drag and drop and stuff. Instead, we're looking more along the lines of the database scheme, how to use and how to work with the DLL, uh, the DDL compiler, and the, the data definition, and the dictionary manager. And we'll, we're going to go through all of these different components by the end of this second weekend, actually. So the database system catalog that's going to be stored in the database system itself. This is more the architectural part of um, or an overview of the architectural part that we'll be looking at. And the architecture doesn't change very much. The concept is the same and the supply stores a lot of other databases as well outside of just Oracle. So everyone's going to have a query processor. Everyone's going to have a database manager. Everyone's going to have a file manager. 
So these are all different subcomponents or pieces that make up what we're calling the database. Because the database as a term is kind of general, very broad in terms of what it is. So components of the database manager, um, integrity checkers, authorization control, which is one of the things you get with a database that you don't get with a file system. People have to log into it. They have access control. You can set profiles. In fact, you just saw earlier when I logged into the LMS. Is it called LMS or EMS? EMS. When I logged into the EMS. They changed the name. When I logged into the EMS, you saw the teacher's view, actually. And your view is going to look different, which means we have different accounts. We're both logging into the same system, but your representation or your view of it is different than my view of it, which gives us that access control or the authorization control, setting up profiles and stuff. So database administrators, they're usually the one who sets up the configurations, the profiles, the access, and then they work with it to uh, you know, establish some sort of a, a program or some sort of a system or process for accessing it. So a little bit of the history, it's not a history course, but 1960s, hmm, about the first database. Hierarchical databases came around in the 60s. We're looking at relational database model out uh, further down the road. Um, now we have object-oriented database models. Oracle actually calls itself an object-oriented database. I don't know if I would consider it an object-oriented database. Anything that still uses tables is not an object-oriented database. It's a relational database. The table concept is a relation. So there's pros and cons to using different architectures. Um, however, the relational model is still the most popular right now. There's a lot of other non-mainstream, open-source, object-oriented databases out there, and you may have actually been familiar with one. The differences is, well, in terms of the concept, relational databases don't work too well with programming languages. You know, you're always connecting to the database, you're running a query, you're getting the re query results back from the database, and then you're using it with your programming language. So we'll look at PLSQL, which is a procedural language to connect with Oracle that will allow you to program the database from the database instead of doing a query and getting results and stuff. Um, so we'll look at PLSQL, probably not until the second weekend. Um, but that's about as close as you can get with Oracle in terms of being able to actually use it that way. So object-oriented databases came around and said, hey, it looks, works with Java. So you can incorporate the database concepts and manipulation in with the Java programming language or in with C++ or in with... so. That's where object-oriented databases are becoming a little bit more popular. They integrate better with programming languages, but they're not as reliable, and they're not as user-friendly, and they're not as easy to work with, and they're not mainstream. They're not, you know, if you're a bank and you've been in business for 20 years, are you seriously going to, like, you know, remove all your programs and replace it with object-oriented versions of it? Not really. Just the same way you're not going to change it, and you're not going to fix it unless it's broken kind of concept. Um, and we have a lot of databases out there that have been out there for years. So relation is not going away. Relational databases are going to be there forever uh, until all the programs that have been written for them and all the big companies that are using them are going to abandon them, which they're not going to do. So, Which is kind of the weird thing because uh, the same phenomenon has actually occurred with some programming languages from the past, like Fortran and COBOL. There's still jobs for Fortran and COBOL programmers, believe it or not. Not as many, however. But there's some big companies that have programs written in those languages that need support, that need people to maintain those programs. So it's kind of funny. Until the big companies get rid of it, it's not going anywhere. So, so here's some terminology we have. Uh, here's your vocabulary for today. If you've never taken an undergraduate database course, these are the things you should probably be familiar with. The concept of the relation. And this might just also be an English vocabulary kind of review. A relation is a table. So with rows and columns, looks like a spreadsheet, not a spreadsheet, but it looks like a spreadsheet. In fact, Microsoft Access treats it like a spreadsheet, sort of. You know, it actually shows you visually. You'll never know which row is in which row, which column is which column. You don't get that information on a, a true relational database. The attribute is the attribute is the name of the column. So columns are attributes. So when we look at entity relationship diagrams, we have entities, attributes, and you know relationships. Or, yeah. So attribute is a key component. The attributes turn into the columns. And we have the domain, which is kind of interesting. So the domain is a set of allowable values for one or more attributes. 
So gender has to be an M or an F. Uh, month has to be 1 through 12 or something. And it's a set of values. A tuple. I don't like the word tuple because I don't use it very much. I like the word row. But a tuple is a row. But a tuple comes from uh, the mathematical concepts behind it. So it's the more proper word for it. Uh, but row, call it a row. Uh, degree. So I use degree a lot, actually, in terms of the vocabulary. The degree is the relationship, and there's the number of attributes it contains. Uh, another word, cardinality. So cardinality is another math word. I sort of like the word anyway, but uh, not that I'm not really a huge math fan. But uh, cardinality's relationship is the number of tuples it contains. So when I say degree, uh, and we'll see this when we go through the entity relationship diagramming. If we have students who take classes, we have a binary degree. We have student because we have the number of entities is two, so we have students who take classes. If I take and make that into a three-degree relationship, I could say that students take classes at ITU <laughs> or uh, with 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 an uh, instructor or in a department. So I add the third degree. So it's the degree is usually the number of participating entities that are associated with the relationship. I'm going to review all of this stuff when I get into de design, but. Just to give you the vocabulary, that's the definition in terms of cardinality would be how many students are taking how many classes at how many universities. So it's the number of participations in terms of the entities. So it's the number of, uh, number of rows that it contains, if you want to think of it that way, or tuples that it contains. And then the relational database is the collection of the normalized relations. So you can have a relational database software and not have relational database. If everything is all stored in one table, there's no relations. It's just a table, which is why people get Microsoft Access and they oh, I'm creating a relational database. It's all in one table. There's no relational database there. It's a table that's what you created. And you put stuff in a table. It may as well just be a spreadsheet. So spreadsheets are not a replacement for databases in that concept. So you usually get the business students who come in and say, isn't it like a spreadsheet? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not a spreadsheet. Properties of relations. Uh, a relation has a name that is distinct from all of the other names in the system. So a relation is a table. A table of students. Students would be the name of the relation. Each cell of the relation combines exactly one atomic value. Each row or each cell is holding one piece of information, not multiple. So usually you end up with bad database design as you have cells that hold multiple attributes that really should be in separate attributes. As a classic example, if I created a student table and a registration table without a classes table, or you know, it shortened the design a little bit, and in the student table it said, uh, you know, Barbara, Hacker, first name, last name, class number one, class number two, class number three, class number four. That would be a second normal form database, first of all. Because you have duplications where you could have just taken and put class. <laughs> Actually, that would have been in a separate table anyway. But what I'm talking about is when you have first name, last name, classes, and it says one class, comma, second class, comma, third class, comma. That's first normal form. That's really bad. <laughs> That's storing more than one value per a single value cell, which is not good either. You'll see this. You'll see it. actually all you, I want you to know what to look for when you start looking. You go to a consultancy and you look at a database table and you go, "Uh, people do this." And you see it, and it's like, "Why did you do that?" Oh, because they're trying to fix a problem. Probably these okay. So the good database design that we're going to look at starts to looking at the problem as a description of the problem models the description of the problem, take the description model, turn it into the table structure, and voila, you have a really good third normal form design. And then what ends up happening is life happens. The company grows, the company has new products, new stuff happens, and then people start hacking at the table structure and they start adding stuff that didn't exist before, wasn't part of the original design. And then you get hired to come in and fix it. So what I do is I just take dump all the data out, recreate, or actually leave it alone until I have it all set, recreate the design from scratch, design it from the start, 
redesign it, take all the old data, dump it out, put it into the new tables, organize it better, and the problem's fixed. Because it's actually cleaned up, or corrected. It's database cleaning, database uh, maintenance. Sometimes you just have to take it down, redesign it from scratch, put it back up. This is essentially what the concept is. Um, but you'll see all these problems. Uh, each attribute has a distinct name. Values of the attributes um, are all of the same domain, which means they're all numbers, they're all characters. The order of the attributes has no significance to it, uh, which is interesting. Uh, there's no order. Just because you put one student, two student, three student in, it doesn't come in one, two, three. Uh, and a tuple is distinct. There's no duplicate tuples, no duplicate rows. If there are, you don't have third normal form. And the order of the tuples is not significant as either, so there's no significance to that. So what is a relational model for the database? Well, there's fundamental rules, there's structural rules, integrity rules, data manipulation rules, and data interdependent rules. This is where we come into the relational properties of something being null, not null, unique, not unique, primary key, foreign key, and we can specify and we should specify something is a foreign key and something is a primary key. And I'm going to go into the key constraints uh, as well as we go through. This is just the introduction at this point. And then we have entity relationship modeling. Some of you who have taken software engineering have, have been exposed to the concept already. And um, we're going to apply it towards databases. It's a theoretical modeling approach where we take the problem description, we translate it into the model. Then there's a way, and if you've taken my software engineering course, I didn't show you how to translate it, but there's a way of taking the translated diagram, excuse me, there's a way of taking the diagram and translating it into a set of tables with key constraints. And it, the, the diagram is going to tell you how many tables you're going to have. It's going to tell you what's going to be in each one of the tables and what are the foreign and what the primary keys are going to be. And also, um, you know, it's, it's basically going to give you a third normal form design. And then you take that design and you go over to your database and you put it in. That's what you're doing. We're using the tool. So we're not going to put it in, but we're going to create the design. So you may put it in optionally. It depends on whether or not you want to see it live. So, so you have tons of practice. The entity relationship diagram it has three components, as I mentioned before: entity types, attributes, and relationship types. I have a full lecture I'm going to do after we take a short break. Actually, um, that's going to get into that concept or start the concept right before lunch. So. So I'll save that information. And then I have been talking about normalization. And so here's kind of a brief kind of look at what we're looking at. Uh, it's nice to talk about normalization on the first day only because that's what we're trying to shoot for. This is giving us our good design. It is called normalization. There's no other word for it. Uh, technique for producing a set of relations with desirable properties given the data requirements. Uh, UNF, unnormal formed. <laughs> A table that contains one or more repeating groups. So these are spreadsheets, actually. People have put the data together in spreadsheets have repeating groups. I'll be going over this in a lot more detail as well. So don't. Uh, this is not your complete normal form lecture. Uh, first normal form is a relation which, which the intersection of each row and column contains one or more values, which means you can actually have multiple dependencies. And I'll talk about dependencies. Um, uh, as well coming up. Second normal form, if it's in first normal form and then every non-primary key attribute is fully functional and dependent on a primary key. So we can have second normal form where we have dependencies, transient dependencies, where one value is dependent on another value which is in the same table, which is in the same row, which gives you a circular transitive dependency that occurs between the same row. Not so good actually. It relies on too much information. And then we have third normal form where everything's separated out. There's no transient dependencies. Every key attribute relies upon a primary key, which is good. Classic example of that a t transit de t dependency would be, let's say for example we had uh, employee, well, let's say we had students here and students had uh, TA jobs as an example. And each TA was being paid something else, something different. Like we had, I think everybody, all TAs make the same thing here, but let's say they don't. And you have a bad relationship design if you have a student, first name, last name, TA, position, TA1, with a salary in the same table. 
and then you have another row down that says TA1 with a different salary in the same table. Well, that actually has two problems associated with it, but you have a transient relationship because you have to actually pick the salary out of that table that's associated with the T1, but it's not just the T1 or TA1, it's the person. So you have multiple relationships within the same data, which is in the same row. Terrible design, but it's out there everywhere. So, so a lot of stuff we'll look at, you know, I'm going to say a terrible design, but you're going to look at a company that you're working for, and you're going to go, oh, our table's designed that way. Yeah, terrible design. <laughs> Saying and not practice, this is like, you know, in practice it doesn't work out because people just add stuff. Oh, yeah, we need a birth date. I mean, it's in there. Or we have a table, a student table, that has social security number. Actually, I guarantee you the ITU table is like this. In fact, we'll have a problem coming up, and they'll have to decide what they're going to do. Because we'll have student ID, which is great. But then we'll have domestic students, and it'll be social security number. Well, international students don't have social security numbers, or some of them don't actually. So, and you might have passport numbers, and some domestic students don't have passport numbers. So we're going to have inconsistencies in terms of the table, unless someone redesigns it and comes up with a different business rule that says, "How about government ID?" or "How about you know?" and then label it differently. But people actually have to think about this because the design of the database is supposed to mimic the business rules of the company. And the business people don't know anything about technology or the database. They just say, hey, do it. We need to keep track of social security numbers. OK, so now you're going to have a column in your table that's going to have social security number in it, but you're not going to have one. So it's going to say, uh, instead of no first name, NNFU, whatever, it's going to say no SS, uh, SSN, <laughs> which is kind of a waste, actually. Because then now what if you have another piece of ID? How are you going to put that in there? Are you going to put it in the social security number column? OK. If you do that, then people are going to think it's a social security number when it's not. So you actually get stuff like that. And then people do a query on it and say, all of our students are domestic. How'd that happen? Because they all have social security numbers. It's like you can't tell the difference. <laughs> so anyway, it causes business rules to, to, to violate business rules, but also causes confusion. Uh, so then we get the third normal form where we don't have issues like that. That's actually a first normal form issue, but uh, BCNF, another form that's even higher where every uh, where there's determinant is a candidate key. So a BCNF is basically making more tables out of that third normal form. So everything is determinate by a candidate key. And I'll talk about candidates when I talk about data, uh, design in a few minutes. But a candidate, a social security number and a student ID are both candidates. And if you have that in the same table, you're not in BCNF format. Because what you've got is duplicate keys. So let's say, for example, we have social security number and we have student ID in the student table. And we query the table to see how many students we have at ITU. And we query the social security number. We're going to have a get different number that's going to come back. It's going to say, you know, 200 <laughs> or something, I'm guessing. And then we query student IDs, and we're going to get 1,000. And you're going to go, which one is it? Well, those are two candidates that are queryable, that are used as double primaries. There's no such thing as a secondary key, by the way. No such thing. There's only primary keys. So in the old days, people used, well, there's a primary, there's a secondary, there's a this. Because Microsoft Access allows you to designate a secondary key. They don't do that anymore, but they used to. And people go, oh yeah, primary key is the social security number, secondary key is the uh, student ID. Why? Because then you're going to get inconsistencies. And then people will create a primary key. And they'll go, yeah, look at that, I know what I'm doing. I got a primary key. But then they won't create a foreign key. And if you don't create a foreign key, you have no referential integrity. You have no way of guaranteeing that when you link the two tables together, you're going to get a complete one-to-one. -one you're going to get whatever happens to match over here, which is going to give you a separate designation, a separate number. So if I queried how many students are taking this class, and I don't designate that as a foreign key in the classes table, I'm going to get a, a wrong number probably, most likely. So, Which is, you can tell when people run reports and they go, oh, the report's wrong. Why is the report wrong? Because the query is wrong. It's not, it's not the query, it's the database has got the problem. The database, it's the database is allowing you to produce unreliable 
inconsistent results. The problem is with the database, not with the reports. So. Okay, so we have fourth normal form. So it's a BCNF format that combines no trivial multi-value dependencies, which means we're taking out all of the all the trivial data. You know, like do we need to know as a student, do we need to know your hair color? It might change actually throughout the course. <laughs> Who knows? My mind's getting grayer actually, but <laughs> don't need to record that. <laughs> don't need to have to anything. Do we need to know your birth date? Yeah, probably. Do we need to know your age? No. <laughs> we can calculate your birth date. We can calculate your age. So, and stuff like that brings it into fourth normal form. Fifth normal form, the relation contains no joint dependencies. That's pretty hard. Which is joint dependency means that if in order to have a classes table, you have to have this table and this table and this table all combined together in a query in order to get that concept. It's almost impossible to do that, which is why people normally stop around the third normal form. Because you can only run the query one way in order to get that information to work correctly when you get it down to the fifth. But people want flexibility. They don't want constraints. They don't want to have to do things one way. And if you don't have any join dependencies, then you really have to tweak the design to make it work, actually. So. Most join dependencies are necessary. If you get rid of the join dependencies, the database is hard to work with. So join dependency would mean you have to join the tables together in order to get the results. You can't just find it through a couple of queries with not all the sets together. So. Okay, so we went through the database views already. And I'm not going to go through the history of SQL. Just to uh, give you some insights in terms of the categories, and these are just categories, DML would be referred to data manipulation language, which is select, insert, update, delete. Data definition language, that's dropping a table, altering a table, creating a table. So we have sets of SQL that are divided out into both categories, actually. And the only language that's being used to manipulate the database is SQL structured query language. It's the same language that's being used for all databases. So whatever you learn in this class applies towards MySQL, towards Informix, or if that's still around, Microsoft Access, and Oracle as well. We will be looking at the view concept. We can create database views, uh, which are pseudo tables that don't really exist, uh, that will be able to uh, provide uh, query results that are stored or cached that we can look at faster than running a query. We'll I'll be also looking at integrity and integrity enhancement features, primary key, unique, foreign key, access control, embedded SQL, host language variables, application programming interfaces, and then also the concept of the dynamic SQL is used as well. So in terms of the Oracle database, in terms of understanding uh, components, uh, looking at memory structure, process structure, storage structures, and uh, not too many new features, but these are some of the components that we'll be looking at, probably not till the second class weekend meeting. This weekend is going to be on database design and in the start of SQL, but uh, later on we'll be looking at some of these components here. The standards have pretty much stayed the same. Features have been changed throughout the years, uh, you know, especially when we get into 11G, which is the current version. So, not really focusing on the application though. So, I'm not going to look at shared memory really, uh, buffer blocks, redo logs. So, I'm kind of going to thumb through this a little bit here because some of it is a little bit overkill for right now, and I'm going to go back to, through a lot of this stuff in a lot more detail as we go through. So. Um, we'll also be looking at the storage architecture second weekend. So actually up to this point, this is all second weekend stuff. So an introduction to the second weekend, I'll save it for the second weekend. How's that? Because <laughs> so, you're not going to remember this stuff anyway after this weekend. So, so storage architecture, storage data, storage blocks, extents, segments. So I'll revisit this lecture at the start of uh, weekend number two. So. So I think it's time for our first 10-minute bathroom break, no? Because I just ended the first lecture. So uh, it is now 10.31. So 10-minute break, 5-minute or 10-minute break for the bathroom break? How about the 10, uh, 
10.45-ish? We'll start back up. Okay, 10.45, you may use the restrooms. 